Hello and welcome to another case review. So today I'm going to be taking a look at this new PureBase 500DX from BeQuat. And I've recently put this build together in the case and I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on having built in this case with you. The other thing that I've done is since I've put this build together, I've done some quite extensive thermal testing with a number of different layouts. So if you are thinking of getting this case, the results of that thermal testing is going to be useful to you in helping decide, one, should I get this case? And two, if I do get it, what's the best way to lay out my components to get the most out of this case? So before I come on to that, I want to highlight what is different with the new DX version of this case compared to the original PureBase 500. And I think the most obvious change is the large mesh front panel on the case. So be quiet, I've gone a slightly different direction with the DX version of this case compared to the original PureBase 500, and they've tried to optimize it as much as possible for airflow. And the new mesh panel is a major part of that. The other thing that they've done is the original PureBase 500 came with an interchangeable top panel. So you had a solid top panel, but also a mesh top panel. Whereas the new PureBase 500 DX only comes with a mesh top panel. And again, that makes sense. If you're going to have a case which is optimized for airflow, you're not going to want a solid top panel on it. The other thing that you're going to notice right from the front of the case is that it now includes two addressable RGB strips down the front panel. So these addressable RGB strips can be controlled. There's a little button on the top panel that lets you cycle through all the different addressable RGB modes. There's also a connector which allows you to plug this into your motherboard and allow your motherboard to control the lighting on the front panel of the case. Not quite as obvious, but there is a second addressable strip along the top front of the case, just in front of the top fans. So again, if you're going to go with the standard fans that come with this case, which don't include any RGB, that's going to add a nice little bit of light on the top of the case. So again, a useful feature as well as included it on the front of the case. Other things that you're going to notice that are different, we've now got a USB 3.1 Type-C connector on the front panel, although it has come at the expense of one of the 3.0 Type-A connectors. The original PureBase 500 had two Type-A's, we've now got one Type-A and one Type-C. Um, the new case also comes with three 140 millimeter Pure Wings 2 fans, whereas the original PureBase 500 only came with two of the fans. So in essence, you're getting a mesh front panel with addressable RGB, you're getting an extra fan, and you're getting a Type-C connector. Okay, so now I want to come on to my thoughts on having built in this case, starting off with what I liked. And the first thing I liked about this case is the build quality. This is a really well put together case and all the parts feel really premium. I had no issues with uh, through screading, paints coming off the case as I'm screwing in and out the fans a number of times as I've done a number of different configurations for the thermal testing. All the panels went on really well. The back panel has a good design where it slides and locks. There's a nice um, bracket that hides the cables on the front and hides the, um, particularly the cables coming out of the hard drive. The mesh panel on the top just slots into place. You're not having to fiddle with it to line things up. There's a nice bracket on the back that screws into your power supply, allowing your power supply to slide in from the back of the case. All the cables plugged in really well to the motherboard and there's plenty of cable ties um, which are Velcro in the back of this case allowing for easy cable management. So it's well thought out and all the parts feel really premium. The other thing I liked about this case is it's not the largest case but you're able to fit a lot of hardware into it. So it takes up quite a small space on your desk compared to other cases that I've looked at, like the PC-11 Dynamic and the LAN Cool 2. This is by far the smallest, but you can fit so much into it. So I have got a 360 millimeter AIO radiator on the front with push-pull configuration. 
I've got an EITX motherboard in the case, and I've got a large Strix 2080 Ti graphics card, and it all fits well. So small footprint, but you can fit an awful lot into it. Likewise, when it comes to the back of the case, they haven't skimped on space here. Some of the others, you're really struggling to fit all your cables in and try and get the back panel closed. Again, there's no difficulty with that. It's designed properly to allow you for all the cables, particularly the power supply cables, to be rooted and have no difficulty closing the back panel. So a really well thought out case with plenty of space. Um, other things I liked about this case, in particular, I like the addressable RGB strips in the front of the case. I think these look absolutely great. I'm not a big fan of lots of flashing multiple colours, but I, I think the white that I've got this set to looks good. Again, I like the little strip along the top. Um, I've gone for addressable RGB fans, but if you were going to use the standard fans that don't have any RGB, that little bit of light at the top just shows off your components really well. So that was smart. The other thing I really like about the case, if you have decided to go for addressable RGB fans at the front, you can see these through the mesh panel. And this looks absolutely great on this build. Again, something I wasn't expecting. Again, if you want to go with the standard black fans, and there's no reason not to, they do a, a great job at cooling the case and keeping noise to a minimum, you're gonna have the ability to add some light to the front of the case with the two RGB strips. So you can win either way, no matter what way you decide to use components in this particular case. Another thing I liked was the option when it comes to mounting hard drives. Um, I much prefer the M.2 SSDs, but if you're going to use the traditional SATA SSDs or hard drives, there's plenty of options for mounting them in this case. If you've got some of the fancy ones with the RGB, there's the option to display them in the front. You've got a little bracket which um, is removable to help build and then goes on to the front and it can hold two SSDs. And one of the nice features of this bracket is that it hides the cables coming out of the SSDs. So if you've got some of the nice fancy RGB SSDs, that's the perfect place for them. My um, SSD that I put into this build didn't have any RGB and I didn't really want it on display. So again, there's the option to mine two of them on a separate bracket on the back of the case. And I like the idea of this bracket. There's a little thumb screw which lets you take the bracket off you can screw the SSD to the bracket and then attach it back onto the case. So I much preferred this method of attaching it compared to the little bits of rubber that then slide in. This felt much more secure and much more premium. As well as that, there's a traditional hard drive cage that goes down the bottom of the case. And the biggest feature for me about this was I love that I was able to remove it because I don't have any of the traditional hard drives. So for me, removing that meant more space for um, airflow and also more space for cables at the bottom of the case. And then the final thing I liked about this case was the fact that it comes with three 140 millimeter fans included. So although I didn't use these for my build because I wanted to use ones that had the RGB on it, um, and as well, when I came to the thermal testing, I wanted to keep it similar to the previous cases that I've tested so we could do a like-by-like -like comparison. Um, there's no reason not to use these. And we know from others' reviews um, and the layout that Be Quiet have chosen, one on the front, one on the top, and one at the back, they do a great job of cooling this case at very minimal noise. So again, you don't need to spend any extra money on fans if you don't want to. What's included will do a perfectly good job. So now we come on to if I was building in this case again, would I do anything different? Um, quite often you'll put parts in in a different order or you'll like put something in and have to take it out to install something else. So I didn't really have any problems with this in this case. From others' reviews, there had been complaints that there was limited room to plug in the cables at the top of the case with the fans already installed. Again, this isn't something I would ever do. I would always uninstall the top fans, plug in the cables, and then put the fans back in. So if you are going to try and plug particularly the power supply cables to the CPU in, you're going to struggle with the top fans in place. So take the top fans out, plug in your cables, and then put the fans back in. 
The other thing people had complained a little bit about was the cables at the bottom were difficult to plug in as well. Um, the bottom of the motherboard is very close to the bottom of the case and all the cables at the bottom are a little bit more tricky to plug in given that space confinement but just requires a couple of extra seconds and a little bit more focus when plugging them in. And as there's no bottom fans in the case, you're not going to have any difficulty there. The other thing when it comes to cables, I'm a big fan of these um, custom cable extensions and I like these black and white ones from Cable Mod and I've used these in a number of my builds. So when it comes to this particular case, the power supply cables for the CPU on the top left hand side of the motherboard and the 24 pin connector on the right of the motherboard are so much hidden. There's no need to buy cable extensions for these particular parts. The only cable extensions you need are the ones for the graphics card. By all means, if you put the other ones in, you're not going to see them. It's going to cost you more money and you're going to have more issues with cable management at the back of the case. So save yourself a little bit of money for this case and just get the ones for the graphics card. That would be my advice to you. The other thing you'll probably notice, and I've mentioned already, I have put an EATX motherboard in this case. Despite the case not officially supporting EATX, the, the biggest motherboard that it supports is ATX. And the motherboard fits, it looks well, but it has come at a cost. And I want to explain that to you in case you're thinking of doing something similar. So the little bracket that I've said that can display two hard drives on display at the front and covers the cables, I haven't been able to screw that in fully. So it is positioned slightly further to the right of the case to allow the 24 pin cable coming in to the motherboard to fit. If I had put it in this correct place, I wouldn't have been able to plug that cable in. The other thing that I've had to do is I've not been able to plug in the USB 3.0 cable with this bracket in place. If I had wanted to plug that in, I would need it to have removed that hard drive cable cover to allow it to be plugged in because the angle of my uh, USB 3.0 on the motherboard is coming off to the side. Had it been facing forward, I would have no difficulty plugging that in and keeping that bracket there. So it has come at a cost, plugging an EATX motherboard in wouldn't be something I would recommend and I would stick with the manufacturer's recommendations and limit it to ATX. Um, although if you do want to do this, it certainly is possible. And again, you could modify that little bracket um, if you did want to do this as well. The reason I have done it is when it comes to comparing like with like, um, I want to compare exactly the same hardware in this case compared to some of the other cases that I have reviewed. And that was the reason that I did that. Okay, so now I want to come on to some of the things that I maybe didn't like about the case. And actually the list is really small and I had to think quite hard about these. So the first thing is that I've always liked having bottom fans on any case. And there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, I find when it comes to thermal testing, they have improved the GPU temperatures. The other reason I like bottom mounted fans is that most of your cables in your motherboard, if you look at the motherboard, plug in right down at the bottom. And if you don't have fans there, all those cables are on display. Whereas if you have bottom mounted fans, all those cables that plug in are hidden by the fans. And when you look at this case, there's a perforation along the bottom. You can actually fit two 120 millimeter fans and screw them in through the little perforations. So when I first looked at this, I thought that Be Quiet had missed a trick here. Why hadn't they included the option to mount two bottom mounted fans? The recent case, the Lanco 2, which I reviewed, has this as an option. And when I tested it, it resulted in a decrease in both CPU and GPU temperatures under load. So when I went on to do the thermal testing, the reasons Be Quiet haven't gone for this became clear. And I'm going to share those results with you later on in the video. Although the fact that there's no bottom fans, I do have one complaint. And that is the multicolored HD audio cable that plugs into the bottom left hand corner of the motherboard is fully on display at the bottom of the case. So in my opinion, if you're going to go for a case that doesn't include any fans at the bottom, you should have some sort of sleeving over those multicolored cables 
because nobody wants to look at that. Um, they'd be much better all in black. And then I suppose the only other negative is the sacrifice of a USB type A for the addition of a USB type C on the front panel. Um, I would much rather have kept both the type A's on the original PureBase 500 and added the type C rather than swapping them. However, if you were going to give me the choice of um, two type A's versus a type A and a type C, I'll pick the type A and the type C. Um, if I'm been picky, I would much rather have had both. When it comes to the ARGB, I think this is brilliant. It's one of the case's best features. The only way to maybe make it slightly better in a future revision would be to include a little connector that allows you to expand this. Some other cases that work in a similar way have done this. So if your motherboard doesn't have addressable RGB, you can plug into here and then it'll use your uh, case itself as a controller for other RGB components in the case. Okay, so going on to look at the thermal performance of the case. So before I go on and give you the results, um, I think it's important to explain how I do my thermal testing. So the first thing is I have the ambient temperature control to 20 degrees C, and I don't modify any of the default fan curves that come with the motherboard. So they're all running at stock. And then I test three different things. So I get the idle temperatures by letting the PC run in Windows with no programs in the background and record the minimum CPU and GPU temperature over a 30 minute period. The next thing I do is I play um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey for 30 minutes and record the maximum CPU and GPU temperature during that 30 minute period. Finally, I run an IDA64 stability test with all components in the PC being stressed and record the maximum CPU and GPU temperature during that 30 minute period. Okay, so let's have a look at the results. Okay, so the minimum CPU idle temperature was 35 degrees C and the minimum GPU idle temperature was 31. During 30 minutes of gaming, the maximum CPU temperature reached 61 degrees C and the maximum GPU temperature was 68. During the 30 minute IDA64 stability test, the maximum CPU temperature was 81 and the maximum GPU temperature 68 degrees C. Okay, so now I want to go on and compare the results with the PureBase 500 DX to two other cases that I tested recently, and they are the Landcool 2 and the PCO11 Dynamic. So looking at the idle temperatures first of all, so the Landcool 2, the CPU ran one degree hotter at idle at 36, and in the PCO11 Dynamic, it was exactly the same temperatures as the PureBase 500 DX at 35 degrees C. GPU, again, in the Landcool 2 also ran one degree hotter at 32 degrees C, where the PCO11 Dynamic was one degree cooler at idle at 30 degrees C. During the 30 minutes of gaming, there was a big difference in the CPU temperatures with the PureBase 500 DX being the clear winner. Um, the CPU temperature of 61 in the PureBase 500 DX was a whopping seven degrees cooler than the 68 we got in the Lanco 2 and six degrees cooler than the PCO11 Dynamic at 67 degrees C. Looking at the GPU temperatures, again, the PureBase 500 DX was the winner here at 68, which was two degrees cooler than the Lanco 2 at 70 degrees C, and a whopping seven degrees cooler than the PCO11 Dynamic at 75 degrees C during the same tests. Um, going on to look at the IDA64 stability test, and again, the PureBase 500 DX was again the clear winner here, uh, in both CPU and GPU temperatures. So the maximum CPU temperature of the PureBase 500 DX was 81 here, which was six degrees cooler than the Landcool 2, and three degrees cooler than the PCO11 Dynamic. GPU temperatures of 68 in the PureBase 500 DX were one degree cooler than the Landcool 2, and a whopping six degrees cooler than the PCO11 Dynamic. Okay, so I think from the results of that thermal testing, it's very clear that BeQuest have done a great job with this case, and I've got some of the best temperatures I've been able to out of the same components in this case that I have in two of those other cases. Now, some of you who watched my previous builds will be 
pointing out a pretty obvious difference in those builds and that is that in this build I've gone with a push-pull configuration on the radiator whereas in the other builds I only had a pull configuration on the radiator. So did that make any difference and this is something that I have tested. So I took three of the fans off the radiator and left the radiator just in a pull configuration with three LL120 fans on it and compared this to my original build and push-pull. So taking the three fans off meant that the idle temperatures on the CPU ran one degree hotter at 36 and the GPU also ran one degree hotter at 32 degrees C. During the IDA64 stability test, the CPU ran three degrees hotter at 84 degrees C, while there was no difference to the GPU temperature remaining at 68 degrees C. So definitely the push-pull configuration did improve the CPU temperatures, but how does that new configuration compare to the other two cases? So the um, idle temperatures of 36 and 32 for the CPU and GPU respectively were exactly the same as the LAN Cool 2, whereas the PC11 Dynamic ran slightly cooler at idle, 35 and 30. During the IDA64 stability test, with just the pull configuration on the PureBase 500 DX, it was still the winner. It had a maximum CPU temperature of 84 degrees C compared to 87 and the GPU ran one degree cooler as well at 68 compared to 69. When it comes to the CPU temperature and the PC11 dynamic, they were exactly the same in this configuration. However, there was a massive difference in GPU temperatures, uh, 68 versus 74 in the PC11 dynamic. Okay, so even taking three of the fans off the radiator, the um, PureBase 500 DX is still the winner out of the three cases when it comes to thermals. And again, this serves as a good example as well. People are often asking, how much will I reduce my CPU temperatures by adding push-pull on my radiator? And the answer to this is under load, you'll save three degrees on your CPU temperatures and no difference to your GPU temperatures. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to do was test and see if removing the front dust filter would make any difference to the temperatures. Um, certainly looking at other people's reviews, a few people are saying that you could actually take the front dust filter out because the mesh panel on the front of the case will limit dust flow. Um, I'm not so sure it will. The holes in the front mesh of the case are actually quite big, where the holes in the dust filter are actually quite small. So taking the dust filter off uh, reduced the CPU idle temperature down to 34 from 35 in the standard configuration and made absolutely no difference to the GPU temperature at idle. CPU temperature under load, again, no difference with the dust panel off at 81 degrees C, and you save one degree on the GPU temperatures down to 67 from 68. So again, my results are a little bit different to what others have found with removing the dust filter. Others have found removing it gets a good reduction in CPU temperatures. And the only thing I can think to explain that is the push-pull configuration on the radiator is overcoming the resistance caused by the dust filter. So if you're going to go push-pull on the front, I would leave the dust filter in, keep your PC free of dust, and it's going to have minimal effect on thermal performance. The next thing I did was I took off the front panel and the dust filter to see what difference that made to temperatures. And importantly, I want to explain the reason for doing that. It's not that I'm advocating that anybody should do this because your, your PC is just going to end up full of dust. The front panel, the dust filters have a job. But what it does is the difference between the front panel being on and the difference between the front panel being off, it gives you an idea of how much the front panel is limiting airflow. And certainly when I tested the LAN Cool 2, taking the front panel off, there was a whopping difference in five degrees in the CPU temperatures. So that told me that front panel is significantly limiting airflow. And that's the reason for doing this test, not that I'm advocating you do it. Okay, so with the front panel off, um, no dust filter on, um, the minimum CPU temperature came down to 33, so two degrees saving at idle. And the GPU stayed exactly the same, 31. Under load, um, the CPU temperature, the maximum was 80 degrees C compared to 81 in the standard configuration. Although there was a reasonable saving on the GPU temperatures down to 65 from 68. Okay, so what does this tell me? It tells me that with a push-pull configuration on a radiator on the front of this set as intake, 
the front panel is causing minimum limitation to your flow because removing it and removing the dust filter you're only going to save one degree on your maximum CPU temperature under load. You do get a benefit of three degrees saving on the GPU temperatures although the GPU is already running that cool I doubt that temperature saving is worth it. So again this points to good case design by BeQuiet in that the front panel with my current configuration is providing minimal limitation to our flow. Okay, so the next thing I did was I added two 120 millimeter fans set as intake um, to the bottom of the case. So looking at the results, this made no difference to the minimum CPU temperature at idle, while it actually increased the minimum GPU temperature at idle to 32 versus 31 degrees with the original build. Um, under load with the Ida 64 stability test, it actually increased the GPU and CPU temperature both by 2 degrees C. Okay, so it now becomes clear why there's no mounting holes in the bottom of the case for fans because it actually hurts both your CPU and your GPU. Um, and this came as a bit of a surprise to me because in previous testing and other cases, I've found that bottom mounted fans actually improved in particular the GPU temperatures but I've also found a benefit to CPU temperatures as well by promoting airflow through the case. But again, BeQuiet have done a good job in testing this. They've picked the best fan locations and installing fans at the bottom of the case. Although you can do it, the, the screws and the fans will pass through the bottom of the case and let you screw them in. It's not something you should be doing. And then the final thing I did was I replaced the LL120 fans that I have got set to exhaust on the top on the back of the case with the original Pure Wings 2 fans that came with the case to see would that make any difference to the thermal performance. So at idle the minimum CPU temperature stayed the same 35 degrees although I managed to record the lowest GPU temperatures in the case with this change at 30 degrees versus 31 with the standard configuration and this must just be explained by the slightly bigger fans being more efficient at lower revs per minute. Going on to look at the Ida64 stability test and things weren't as good here. Um, the temperatures in the CPU and the GPU were both up by 3 degrees C um, with the change of the fans. So when it comes to fans everything's a balance between performance and noise and the LL120 fans from Corsair aren't the quietest fans. They run faster than the Pure Wings 2. That explains their increased cooling performance but they were audibly noisier during the testing. Okay, so to sum up, I absolutely love the PureBase 500DX. I think it's a great looking case. It's well built and you can fit an awful lot of hardware into a very small space. The thermal performance is exceptional and the value for money that it offers is incredible. In fact, that they've only, there's only a very mild increase in the price of the case compared to the original PureBase 500 with so many extra features. So I think if you're looking for a new PC case, I would strongly consider the PureBase 500DX. Thanks for watching. Eyes in the sky, gazing far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true, baby, let the light